Now we're always saying, oh, you have to suffer, brother. Honey, the suffering they got in mind is nothing like this. Hundred percent of your day, battle. Uh, what am I thinking? How should I be thinking that? What should I be thinking about that? Oh, I don't think I'm thinking that right. I got to be thinking something else. What about this? What about that? Agonizing over the wording of an email or how you talk to somebody or whether you're peeing correctly. You get anal about it because you want everything to conform. That's another thing that Paul was saying that your thinking becomes like Paul's, which is to say like Christ. You know? Conformance for the purposes of his death. That's also in Philippians. That I may know him and share his sufferings. And that's a motive too at this point. Okay, God, this is how you want to live. You want to suffer. I need to see it your way. I put that on my refrigerator years ago. See through his eyes. Because I need I need to. It's not religious. It's not about being good. This is how he is. I need, need, not want to be a good girl. I need to see the way he does. I need to be close to him. I need that or I don't want to live. Live in Christ, die in profit. That's the flip side of it. Life has absolutely no meaning other than this. How do you see it, Dad? Okay, I don't see it your way, but I need to. I can't stand living. There's no point to living. Kill me now. And you live that the rest of your life. Occupation with Christ means that you just, you just, everything that that he is, you got to be that way too, and you can't handle it. None of this spiritual life can be lived in the body or on human level. The human being just can't. There's just no way. That's what Paul was explaining in Romans eight, first ten verses. Can't. Romans seven, this exact. Just you're always at odds with yourself. You're never going to measure up. Everything's a slog, and there's no other reason to live either. Perfect joining your worst nightmare and your dream come true. Your dream come true at this point is to know Christ. Okay. That's you know earlier in Philippians, Philippians three eleven through fourteen, that whole passage. You throw out your good deeds. That's Paul in Philippians 3.8. And then he goes on to say what replaces all those good deeds. To know him and the power of his resurrection. For purpose of conforming to his death. His sufferings. Because it's intimacy with him. If intimacy with him means suffering, then you want that. And of course a lot of Christians talk about that. But they don't know what kind of suffering it really was. It's in the soul. You don't beat yourself up like the medieval people did, lashing themselves on the back. That's not the kind of suffering it is. It's the constant command pressure. It's the constant knowledge that all these people around you are clueless. But you know. They're diseased. You're immune. You have this mature knowledge. They got zero. So they're poor, you're rich, and you can't give it away. See, that's why Christ said about the Passover, I've been waiting for this to happen. You need the outlet of a suffering. So God gives you that too. He gives you the high, you start having all these prosperities, and they don't mean what they used to mean to you. And then you start having the bottom end too. All kinds of weird stuff happens to you. You lose friends. You lose your job. You lose all kinds of credibility. Everything. It's kind of like the Job series, except it's it's more intense and it's more subtle, and the audience is um, a little different. And then he, you know, restores you. And then he takes it away again. 
my pastor called this momentum testing and evidence testing because that's where you are now you're on trial for the same thing that Satan failed this is what tripped up Satan why God do you choose to live like this you can snap your fingers and have everything exactly the way you want why instead do you make it hard on yourself and go down why do you make it hard on your creatures that they have to go down or they have to live being so much smaller than you and know the difference this is what the whole angelic trial is about this is why the cross defeated Satan because Christ went down farther than Satan could go and actually was made sin 2 Corinthians 5.21 made sin by his own father and he had to keep saying yes to that you want to talk about slog you want to talk about suffering in the soul that's what it says in Isaiah 53.11 in his soul, he labored. And the word there, amal, is used for birthing. The labor pains. That's why Isaiah 54, 1 reads as it does. This is what's going to happen in your soul from the time you start thinking, living Christ, dying prophet onward. And it's, it's like in stages, you know. It's on again, off again. It's Some moments are more intense. You have months... In my case, I had like a three-year stint where it was total disaster. And then one day, one-year anniversary of my pastor's death, bingo, my whole situation changed, reversed. And it's going to go down again, who knows when. He does this to you because he's joining the high and the low. And so you have to have high and then you have to have low to go with it. And the idea is to look at them both at the same time. And honey, I'm not doing a good job of this thing. I can only describe it to you. Walking the talk is a whole different ballgame. But most people don't even know what the talk is. And it's a slog. And it stays a slog. Like Paul said in Philippians 3.14. Until the day you die. And the only way you get through it is like Paul said in Philippians 121. Living Christ, dying prophet. That's why you want to go through Philippians 3, 11 through 14. That I may know him and the, and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. Seeing through his eyes. What did Christ go through down here? What was like life, what was life like for him? That's been, like, that's my consuming, like, focus. That's the only thing that gets me up in the morning. It's the only thing that gets me through the day. And I fail all the time. I have to use 1 John 1, 9, gotta be a thousand times or more a day. It's not whether you fall down. It's whether you get back up again. See, that defeats Satan. So you are in the trial docket at this point. And I cover that in my spiritual maturation process videos. There's a whole chart there of six pages. Really easy to read. You're in the trial docket at this stage. You're at the end of the marathon race. And there are very, very few in your category. And that stage can last like 20 years until you die. Unless you peel off. And you'll zigzag backwards and forward like a little rubber band. You'll go back maybe into childishness for a while and then spring back. You know, it's very, very um, bouncy. And you'll eventually, if you stay with it, you'll stabilize in the stage. And then if you die in that stage, um, you'll be crowned. But it's a slog from this point. The highs and the lows unite. The only thing that gets you up in the morning is to see him. And you're on trial before the angels in the docket, just like Job was, presenting you in evidence. See, here's this Christian, one of very few on the planet. Have you considered my servant Brain Out? Yeah, but Brain Out's sitting all the time, yeah. 
But burnout's not quitting the spiritual life. And then, maybe God's saying the same thing about you. And of course, I don't know if I'm going to stay the course. I might spin out and become at the bottom of heaven before I'm dead. There's no guarantee I'm going to make it. It's a marathon race. you got to get to the finish line. If you quit before you get to the finish line, too bad. It's pass-fail. You die a loser or you die a winner. My pastor spent seven years explaining that and showing it all over the Bible, all the verses. You die a loser or you die a winner. Okay, some people get like within ten yards of the finish line and they quit. Okay, they're still a loser. Other people, they never they never even got into the, the race. Or they just stepped over the starting gate and then they went and sat down. Okay, they're a loser too. See, this is hard. This is weird. Nobody in his right mind would finish the course. And that's why you're in the trial docket. At this phase, the only thing that keeps you going, like Paul said, is I got to know him. I got to see through his eyes. I, I'm stupid. I am wrong. I'm this. I'm that. Who cares? Because it really doesn't matter. Are you a good person? So what? That doesn't buy anything. Are you a bad person? So what? Christ bought you. Doesn't matter. Is God superior to you and you're always failing? Well, of course. But even that stops mattering. All the angst of the earlier childhood and adulthood and adolescence with its preoccupation with self, that just stops. You basically tire out from all those arguments. And there's just one thing you want out of life. To know Christ, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, for the purpose of conforming to his death. Ephesians 3. I mean, Philippians 3. That's it. All other motives for living die. And I mean no offense, and some people are going to find this very offensive. Your family stops mattering to you as much as this. Your job stops mattering to you as much as this. You actually have to retool all of your motives. At this point, you find your motives for your family and your job and just breathing because you want to know Christ and all those things are subsets of knowing Christ. See how every thought is being brought into captivity to Christ? See, it says every thought into captivity to Christ not every thought into captivity to your loved ones. Everybody on this planet would say that's immoral. What? You love somebody more than me? Yeah, you better. Because you don't really start loving them until you love Christ more than them. If you have to choose between Christ and somebody else, what did Christ say? You have to be willing to choose between him and your own family. He said that down here. To leave your mother, your father, your spouse for him in your mind you have to be willing to do that doesn't mean you do it it means that the importance of everything other than him is so secondary that it's almost an indifference at that point you really begin to love everybody and everything else because all of your values redefine there's Christ and nothing else. So now everything else becomes a subset of seeing Christ. At that point, you are more moral, more loving than anybody else on the planet. You don't think of yourself that way. And of your own strength, you're not that way. But he holds you together. 2 Corinthians 5.14 His love basically recharacterizes all of your motives. You're in the trial docket. The world is being blessed because you're in that docket. 
because God has pointed you out and said, have you seen my servant? And then he names the ones that are in the docket. 